Well, greetings. I'm David Kang, the founder and principal of DEI Advisors. We are a nonprofit in Arizona, and our mission is to empower personal success. We are delighted to welcome Keith Barr, the president and CEO of Intercontinental Hotel Group, joining us from London today. Keith, I know you're very busy. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. It's great to be with you, David. Well, congratulations on crossing the 6,000 hotel mark. That's a momentous <laughs> milestone and speaks volumes about your transformative leadership. You've grown edge in so many ways. Kudos to you. Our show is about DEI and personal empowerment. I was excited to read about IG's 10-year journey to tomorrow business plan. Tell us about this plan. What was the impetus and what were some of your goals? Thanks, David. Again, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you today. When we were thinking about the future of the company and how we were going to continue to grow around the world, we recognized that it's critical to grow responsibly and also to be a great employer. And so we thought about our, our journey to tomorrow and talking about it as a journey uh, and really around three basic areas, people, communities, and planet. Fundamentally, we want to make sure that we have a very robust and focused diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging agenda. And set up a number of targets there from women in leadership to ethnicity to how we grow the business more broadly around the world. Then around communities, really thinking about how do we do skills training and bring more people into the hospitality industry? And how do we also support people in times of need through crisis and disaster relief? And then, of course, our sustainability agenda on planet waste, water, carbon as well. And so we went through and really mapped out a series of, of targets in each one of those areas and saying, to be a great company today and for tomorrow, you have to be moving forward in each one of these areas too. So I'm really proud of the targets we've set. They're stretching, they're hard, but if they weren't, they wouldn't be doing the right things for the business and for our communities more broadly. That's that's remarkable. Thank you uh, for paying so much so much attention to these very important issues. Uh, IHG is such a big global hotel company. You do business around the world. And as we all know, the language, culture, and how business is done so different from country to country, region to region. How do you manage that complexity when you're trying to implement ESG and DI initiatives? David, that's an excellent question. And it was one of the real learnings we had as we were beginning to build out our diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda and our strategy moving forward. As you said, big companies, you, you actually kind of want to have some similarities, right? We want to do the same things the same way. And but recognize that in this space, you really can't because what diversity and equity inclusion means varies around the world and the issues vary around the world too. And so what we recognized was we had to have a framework at a group level that could say, these are the things that matter to us. Here's our culture. Here's our values. Here's the things we want to achieve. But how do you then make that locally relevant? And that's where we created regional diversity, equity, inclusion boards. So I chair the, the group level board, and then there are representatives from each region. And we talk about what our strategy and initiatives are, but then we allow the markets to go back and determine, here's the things that really matter most to our teams, to our communities, and to our business within this framework too. And it's really been empowering for the business. They've been able to go out there and say, you know what? This is what really matters in Southern Asia and Korea. This is what really matters in Australia. This is what matters in China. And so that's had a huge impact and also really got people to feel like they owned it versus it being a group level strategy and a group level set of initiatives. And we're saying, here, go do this. It was more of who do we want to be as a company? And then how can you make sure that's locally relevant in your market with your teams? And it's really just built the, the energy and the passion more broadly in the business because of it. That, that's outstanding. And that goes to the saying, think global, act local. And when you Completely. empower people at the local level, you unleash their passion. And, and that's why I think one of the main reasons that, and, and I'm really excited to hear, and one of the main reasons that you were able to achieve regional success is because of that, right? You, I heard that in Greater China, 95% of your executive leadership team is comprised of Chinese nationals. That's just simply remarkable. It was um, when, I, when I moved to Shanghai and we were mapping out the future of our business in China and understanding the scale of that business and how it was going to grow. I mean, today it's over 600 open hotels and nearly 500 in development. Uh, when I was there, it was 100 hotels open and 200 in, in the pipeline too. So you just see how big that business has gotten. 
what I recognized was two things. One was we were going to be growing not just in tier one cities, not just in Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. We we're going to be growing tier two, tier three, and tier four. And when I walked into my first kind of leadership meeting with all of our general managers, I looked around the room, was realizing we had a, our leadership was all expats. Our general managers were all foreign nationals and incredibly talented men and women, but the future of the business was going to be Chinese. And I said, this is going to be our second home market. And we have to build out the talent within this organization to do that. And so we set an ambitious agenda, which was really investing in local talent, investing in localization. And so a number of things was, you know, hire, taking some of our best number two Chinese leaders and putting them with our best general managers in hotels and then quickly fast tracking them. And so looking forward to today, you walk into that general manager's meeting now and it's almost exclusively Chinese nationals. So that's, you know, it's 14, 15 years later, but it has truly transformed our leadership team there at the business. And I think it shows why diversity, equity, inclusion varies around the world, right? So our challenge there was actually localization, moving away from having foreign leadership and foreign GMs to local talent. How do we build that up? What are the HR systems and processes? What are the training programs we had to have? But also shows that DNI and i is a business imperative, right? We know we needed to have that talent to grow. So it wasn't just doing the right thing. It was doing the right thing so we could grow our business and have a leadership position in Greater China. Well, that really speaks to your, not only your commitment to doing the right thing, but having the systems and processes and measurements in place to make sure that it does happen. And like you said, the AI is good for business. And judging by the success you've had, enjoyed in greater China and Asia. I mean, actually, it's one of the best brands uh, known in, in the Asia region. Uh, kudos to you on that. Well, thank you, David. And really, it was, but it was mapping out what that journey was going to be like and saying, here's the, here's the steps along the way. Here's the type of talent we have to have. And actually getting quite clear about what were the milestones, what were the targets, how do we make sure we've got this? Because you know, I would say people hear what you say, but they see what you do. You can talk about localization all you want, but unless you actually are investing in it, and we did, and I remember going back to the leadership of the company saying, this is going to be a scale business in China, and we're going to have to invest in local talent. We can't run this with foreign nationals, and it's going to take time, and it's going to take money, but it will pay off. And so today, it's not kind of this... um. It's, it's kind of self-fulfilling relationship we've got now with our colleagues where we're one of the best, if not the best employer in the hospitality industry at IHG now. And so people keep wanting to come work for us because they can see the career progression, the potential that they have with, to grow in IHG. Yeah, for sure. IHG has a wonderful reputation in Asia region. Thank you. Appreciate your leadership on that. Now, I know, Keith, you've mentored a lot of people. You helped a lot of people with their careers. What is your advice on finding mentors and advocates you know it's a, one of those things that i was reflecting upon personally and thinking about yeah you know, how did i get to where i was in my career and it was working for incredible leaders men and women who gave me opportunities and i was trying to determine but how did how did they find me and how did i find them and i think one of my first pieces of advice would be to make sure you recognize that an advocate and a sponsor doesn't have to be from your group, ethnic or gender, that they can be more broadly into the business too. Because oftentimes to say, well, as a female leader, I should go find a great female leader. Or as an ethnically diverse leader, I should go find an ethnically diverse leader. Recognize that sponsorship and advocacy can come from any place. And I think quickly people often try to narrow it down to saying, I need to find someone who looks like me. Now, I think that works pretty well on the mentorship side because you've got common sets of experiences that people can share the challenges they faced and, and how they approach things. But on the advocacy and the sponsorship, look more broadly. Look out there and find people who, who have similar values and aspirations, people who are known for helping to grow talent into the business, people who um, people want to work for at the end of the day. You know, it's sort of, it's like fellowship, right? You, you When you see somebody that's over there and go, people want to work with this person. There's a reason for that. And it's not just because, you know, they're they're fun to be around. It's going to be because these people have helped people advance their careers, too. So look more broadly for sponsorship and advocacy um, and really find someone who is clearly a leader where people want to follow. And that will help you in your career. That's that's outstanding advice. First of all, look for someone. And secondly, look more broadly. Yeah. That's, that's excellent advice. Thank you for that. Uh, Keith, what would you say to someone 
in your organization who comes comes to you and says, uh, I, I feel challenged in being able to realize my career aspiration? I think a, a few things is being first clear about what your aspiration is and, 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 and what that, that that's going to look like too. Um, because oftentimes I find people want to get promoted but don't actually have clarity about what their aspiration to do is in their career. And they're different things, right? Because you can you can get a bigger job with a different title. But where do you aspire to be? What truly motivates you and gives you passion in the business? And being really, really clear about it, because that's going to help you understand the pathway to achieving your ambition. Oftentimes I find people go, well, I want that job versus the I want, I want to achieve my potential. I want to, I, I, I want, what's that path going to look like too? So, um, and oftentimes I'm sure David, you've done the same thing and you're coaching people. The people have that clarity are the easiest ones to coach and mentor because they kind of go, they know what I'm passionate about. They know what I'm not passionate about. They know what I'm really good at, what I'm not good at. And here's what I want to achieve. Then you would help people. I think people who haven't been that self-reflective are the ones that often struggle in that case too. So it is being very, you know, being be inwardly focused in a way of reflecting upon who you are as a person um, and then helping find that right mentor and advocate to help you realize that potential. But um, I find the people who I have seen progress the fastest are the most self-aware and self-reflective. And the people that have struggled I think, to, to advance their careers often just have a blind spot and they haven't been able to really understand whether it's something about their style, where they communicate, or whatever it may be. Um, and, and so be self-aware and really challenge yourself to understand who you are and what gives you excitement. That's that's such a good advice, Keith. Uh, I, like you said, uh, I've talked to a lot of people. They are unclear about what what their career objections are. I mean, objectives are. A lot of times they just want that next promotion without thinking uh, through. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, David, because I was just we were just talking about coaching one of our senior team the other day and a super high potential individual. Um, and we were talking about helping this person round out their experience base. And they were very um, fixated on title and very fixated on responsibility and saying, you know, what's, what is it gonna be, what is it gonna look like externally? And I was like, honestly, don't worry about it. This is, we, we're trying to build you to be a future leader in this organization. And we're saying, these are a set of experiences that are gonna really benefit you. And it will look great externally as well too, but don't worry about that. Really focus on what what can I learn from this experiences, which will then help me achieve this ambition. And it was really hard for this person to get around it because they were going, well, I, but I want the title and I want it to look like this. And I'm like, don't worry about that. Focus on your, <laughs> focus on learning and building out your competencies here because that's what's going to get you there, not just having a title. Yeah, that's that's so true. Um, we we want to help people. Uh, realize their career aspiration but the first thing is they have to be clear about what it is that they want to achieve and and don't uh, pigeonhole themselves no, and, and absolutely. Thinking only a certain way and broadening the horizon and perspective and gaining the necessary broad experience is it's, it's going to be vital to their future success. i remember david when i was early on in my career you know I, I came i started working in food and beverage when i was a teenager and worked full-time as a chef to pay to go to university and I was a, a passionate foodie. I still am today. Um, but you know how the food and beverage guys are, basically. We, we sort of look down on everybody else who's not a foodie, right? If you're, if you're in sales and marketing or if you're in rib division. Um, and I remember being early on in my career and this amazing general manager, she's incredible. And she goes, I want to actually put you into revenue management and sales and marketing. And I'm like, why would I ever want to do that? And she goes, well, if you ever aspire to be a general manager, there's a lot more to learn than just the operational side of the business. And she pulled me out of food and beverage and dropped me into revenue management, the pricing and the sales and marketing. I thought I had a real passion for it. Actually it turned out to be pretty, pretty decent at it. Um, but if I hadn't kind of opened myself up to that kind of experience of somebody saying, you know, you stop just going down that narrow path of just, I'm just going to be a food and beverage guy and went into sales and marketing then i went into rooms division then i went back into operations then you know it, it was my career i've gone back and forth between sales and marketing and operations multiple multiple times which enabled me at the end of the day to have a set of experiences that set me up to be the chief executive of the company someday 
I've worked in Asia, I've worked in Europe, I've worked in the US, I've worked across operations and sales and marketing and development. You put all those things together and all of a sudden you, you're com complete. But if I'd only stuck to the path I was initially locked in on, I would have never gotten here. Yeah, so true. Watching you, that comprehensive background where you've done food and beverage rooms, uh, sales and marketing and other areas that has really prepared you and the results show a lot of people just land a job but then because they don't have the knowledge base or skill set they fail eventually but look at you that gave you the good foundation to be the transformative uh, leader that you are well i'm dangerous enough to know a little bit about everything now david so you know that's the dangerous thing i guess <laughs> Uh, let's talk about your advice to women and minorities who feel that they don't fit because we look different. Some Sometimes we uh, talk differently. What's your advice to them? You know, this is one thing that I probably have learned the most about in the last few years. We're, in, we're spending a lot of time. We have what are called employee resource groups in our company. And so we have our black employee resources group. We'll have our um, Latino employee resource group, um, women, LGBTQ+. And one of the things I realized in having those conversations, which were tough to hear, was how much pressure a lot of our people in the organization over their careers have felt, I need to look like and act like something I'm not. And to fit in, to get and, and, and in this industry and in industries more broadly. So I think my first piece of advice is, um, don't do that. Don't compromise. Don't change who you are to fit in because you will not bring the best of yourself to work every single day. You will not bring the best of yourself home every single day. Um, and, and we have to confront that as, as leaders and companies, making sure that people feel empowered and supported to come to work who they are and not feel that they have to kind of hide, change, or morph themselves. And that doesn't mean we don't have to learn and grow and, and adapt our skills over time and change our styles and approach in certain situations, but don't compromise on that piece. That's my biggest advice because I think that's the thing that probably will drive the greatest level of dissatisfaction between you and your career when you feel like you can't be yourself. That, that's so true. If, um, I, I know for a long time, I, I'm the only minority on many of the CEO panels. Sometimes I feel like I don't fit. <laughs> Uh, but I always tell myself, well, I have something to contribute. I'm different, and but that's, but I still have something to contribute. Without question, to... David, and you, you're amazing, always up there. And um, so, when my wife and I got married. Um, our families are quite different um, in terms of how we communicate, our styles and approaches to things. And we came up. She came up with a statement early on when it was creating a bit of tension between the two of us. Um, and it became a mantra for our family, but also as I lived internationally and she said to me one day, she goes, it's not bad. It's just different. Uh, and, you know, and, and oftentimes we like to paint things in black or white, right or wrong, good or bad. And she said to me, she goes, it's just not bad. It's just different. You, we communicate one way, you communicate a different way. We can learn from each other on this, but not trying to say that my way is the right way and your way is the wrong way too. And so that was some of the advice I'd always give people who are going to work internationally. I said, because human nature is to say, it's so different. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with it. And I want to say it's not right versus it's just really different. And you can learn from it and accept it. And, uh, and it will make you a better person for that too. And so that's one of my biggest advices to people who are leaders of saying, don't judge, don't rush to judge. Don't rush to put it in right and wrong. It's, it can be just different and we can learn from that. That's right. So true and such wonderful advice. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Keith, uh, looking back your career, you've always, uh, you've had a spectacular career, first with Bristol Hotels and now with XG, and you were doing a really good job at Bristol Hotels, but then it was acquired by XG. And you made the transition very, very well, and you distinguished yourself at XG, landing in several high-profile positions and eventually leading to your current role. Tell us, uh, how did you make that transition and then how did you distinguish yourself? It's, uh, it's been an interesting journey. I just hit um, 30 years between Bristol and IHG last uh, <laughs> July 27th, I think it was. Uh, and I would have never thought that. Um, and then with IHG, I guess for over 20 something, 22 years. It was, um, 
it was a fascinating journey. It was because, you know, a big global company like IHG buying a, a reasonably small company like Bristol Hotels and Resorts at that point, even though it was the largest owner and operator of Holiday and Crown Plaza in the U.S., um, it, you know, it was it was an interesting, challenging time because I, I was sitting there between, you know, the, the team in the U.S. and the team in the U.K. and trying to help them understand one another. And I think that was probably the way that I probably distinguished myself the most was being very objective and balanced and helping each side understand the other side's point of view because it was quite different, right? You sort of, everything that the small company wanted was special to them, say we wanted to keep it. And the big company said, everything we want to do is right. <laughs> and, you know, and I always said that um, it was the, uh, probably the worst career decision I ever made for the first year and the best one ever since being in the middle um, because it wasn't, it wasn't fun. It wasn't easy, um, but it did help me kind of really understand you know, the, the view from a big company and the passion and the importance of culture from the small company, I'm trying to bring those two things together uh, and get the best out of both over time. That's that's the key, isn't it? Being uh, open-minded and balanced in your thinking and finding win-win solutions. That works every time. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, what is your approach to challenges? Because we've all had immense challenges in our career especially with the pandemic and there's so much uncertainty back in 2020. So what is your approach to, to such immense challenges? As, as you know, David, we were, we, were, we were all in this together during the pandemic. And I remember sitting down with my team, because I mean, those are pretty scary times, kind of March, April, on, on personal levels, on a business mm -hmm. level, March 2020, April 2020, um, tough. I said to the team, um, first, they said there was no playbook for this, like you and I talked about. And so we're going to have to make sure through the lens of time, well, people say we did the right thing, you know, whether that's our customers, our colleagues, our owners, and so forth. And I guess the better advice I probably gave the team was the, the scarier things get, the calmer we have to be. And that's your, that's your role as a leader. Because if they see you being calm and in control and measured, you can bring that sense of calm to an organization. If they see the leader all of a sudden not exhibiting that, uh, it does create a lot of uncertainty and concern. And so I think whenever I'm confronted with a big challenge, it is remove the emotion from it, really try to understand what the core issues are and help people to do the same, to really help people to understand it. Uh, because I think it's quite easily in the moment of crisis to feel that that adrenaline, that emotion comes or that challenge and, and taking it at a very personal level. And I think what we were able to do collectively as the CEOs was think about, how do we handle this as an industry? How do we handle this for my company? How do I make sure we're doing the right thing by our people? And that sense of calm, um, you know, for me personally, really just probably kept my sanity and probably <laughs> you, you probably kept your sanity the same way of just going, we're going to get, we're going to get through this. We have a very clear path forward. Um, there's going to be some uncertainty out there, but it's going to be okay. And, you know, I think our job as leaders is oftentimes to be that sort of coach and just say, it's going to be okay. And we have to live with a bit of uncertainty, but, we're going to get through it together. So true. Uh, I think that's a playbook that most of us followed, built relying on the team and being calm and collected and projecting optimism. Uh, that's the playbook. Um, have you, uh, I, I, I'm sure all of us have encountered setbacks and disappointments, and sometimes we get really frustrated and angry. What, what are some of the lessons that you've learned through your own personal experience? Uh, a few. Um, I had to learn to stop taking things personally a long time ago, uh, you know, and because things are going to go wrong, right? And, you know, there's some running companies, the scale that we run, David, you know, it's not going to be perfect in everything that we do. And so having to remove a bit of that per personal sort of um, emotion from it and recognizing th things are going to happen. Um, it's not personal. It's not about you. And um, helping the organization understand that that's going to happen. Because I think people take challenges or when things go wrong very, very personally. And I think if you create a culture where it's supportive, but like holding people accountable, it's different than being accusatory and looking to be critical. And so I think it's, you know, how do you, how do you not make it personal, both for you and for the individual? Um, and then I also think it was resilience. You know, I, I think the most, the leaders that I'm the most impressed with really understand how to, to, to strengthen their own resilience 
the resilience of their business and the resilience of people around them. And that's the people that really can help through the, the most challenging times. Um, can They look after themselves, they look after the people, they look after their family, but they show that level of resilience there too. So I think my biggest things are remove the emotion, don't take things personally, but focus on what gives you resilience and finding that. And for, for me, it was always about, you know, creating a bit of space to, to be able to, you know, separate some of the work things from home. So for me, it's cooking dinner every night when I'm home, you know, so <laughs> I try to, I try to wrap up the day and then I, and then cook dinner to be able to talk to my family. And then I may have to go back to some work later on in the evening, but it creates that space and gives me that time to focus with my family and connect with my family. And they give me that support and that gives me my resilience back. Outstanding. I, I was going to ask the question, how do you find resilience? But you just answered it perfectly. <laughs> it's yeah. taking a break and spending time with family or loved ones and complementalize uh, the way that you think about things. And then all of a sudden, you're strong again. Yeah, the best, the best advice someone gave me was, you know, you got to think about when you walk through that door at home, who do you want to show up as? How do you show up as your best self and and how do you go ahead and do that because you know in, in any leadership role well you know when we also you and i travel a lot right we travel half the year um when you walk through that door at home how do you want to show up you know and i want to show up as a, as a good husband as a good father and a good friend uh and so how, how to make sure i'm ready to do that and then by doing that that gives me that that that, that emotional support at home that resilience and then makes me better at my job outstanding advice Thanks for sharing that. Now, Keith, you've had a spectacular career journey. You've been a transformative leader at XG. You've achieved unprecedented success in your previous roles at XG, whether it's the chief commercial officer or the CEO of Greater China. You've always excelled in every single job that you've had. What are some of the factors that contributed to your success? Uh, I've, I've asked myself that question early on um it's funny i was meeting with a former mentor of mine who actually encouraged me when bristol was bought by ig to, to go work for ig and he goes mm -hmm. you know you have what it takes to be successful there someday and i have sitting down with him a while ago and he goes i always thought you had the potential to be ceo and i was like well, how did you see that and um and, and we talked a little bit about leadership style and talked a little bit about styles and approaches more broadly and i think one of the things that i that has always helped me has I've been inquisitive and I've wanted to learn and, 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 and constantly doing that. Um, and been in situations where even if you're just in a meeting, sitting and listening and observing people who are really, really good at what they do, you go, wow, you, know, you can learn something there. So my first bit of advice is always be learning. Um, and, and I joke around, I said, the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. At 21, I knew everything. And now at 52, I'm realizing how much I don't know. Um, and, and the people who are, who, who are that reflective and realize they're always learning are the ones that are continuing to bring more and more to the table and they have more and more growth opportunity and potential too. the people who kind of close off eventually, you know, you're going to not continue to grow. Um, and so, you know, first bit is always be learning. Um, I, I think also take a few risks, you know, I, I have to tell you, you know, we moved to Australia and I had two uh, young children at that point. And, you know, I remember sitting down with our former CEO and was talking about my career path. And he goes, well, what do you want to do next? You think goes, well, we're happy to live in Sydney. You know, it's a great place to live and don't want to leave Australia. And he said, well, do you want to um, think more broadly about where we go? And I said, well, there's not really a rollback in the U S I said, you know, we'd come to Europe if you'd like. Um, Asia Pacific looks interesting, Japan, maybe. Uh, Middle East, we talked about it, and I said, in China, don't want to go to China. That's, you know, leaving Sydney, going to Shanghai, that's dumping and in, jumping into the deep part of the pool. Um, and he came back at me and goes, well, how do you really feel about China? And, and, and you know, I was like, okay, this is, that's not what I was expecting. But we talked it through and about the opportunity was, you know, he said, Keith, it's going to be our second home market. It's going to be the third of the company's growth. It's a phenomenal opportunity for you to leverage what you've learned throughout your career to help shape the future of the company. Um, and I knew it was going to be challenging, but it was, a, it was, a, and it was going to be a, a risk, but it was an amazing opportunity too. So I guess my second piece of advice is take risk, calculated risks, but recognize that 
there's real benefits to doing some of those more transformational or transformative experiences. Um, and it was, it was humbling and exciting to go ahead and do that. So for it's, again, it's always be learning, take, take calculated risks, um, and just make sure you're working for people who align with your values at the end of the day. You know, um, you've got to work for people who you trust, you respect, who have the right values, who do the right thing, who at the end of the day, you go, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to work with this person. Um, and because that, that's who you want to be as a leader to create that level of followership too. And, um, you know, you, 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 nobody's perfect, right? I mean, we all can do things better or differently, but making sure you're working for people who you really respect at the end of the day, um, it, it, I think is really important. Yeah, so true. I mean, the, the three pieces of advice that you gave, um, being open-minded and always open to learning and taking calculated risk and working with someone who aligns with your value, those three are tremendous factors to success. Appreciate your sharing yeah. that. Thank um, you. I guess by coming to the end of our uh, show, but before we leave, can you give your parting advice to women and minorities who really want to achieve higher careers, who have high career aspirations, but don't know how to go about achieving that? I um, was reflecting upon uh, one of our senior black colleagues left the company uh, a number of years, a couple of years ago, and took a, another great opportunity in adjacent industry. And uh, I gave him some feedback of where his strengths were, ma massive strengths and areas of development. And I said to him, make sure that you're, you're picking your, your career path and the roles that help you address those areas. I said, because you can keep playing to your strengths, but these are the things over here. If you can, if you can work on these and build them up, maybe not as great as these other things you do, huge unlock for your career potential. And I think it's being have, having an open, honest conversations about those things, and especially as, a, as for for women in leadership and ethnically diverse, finding the right mentorship where you can have a safe, open conversation, uh, and then being able to share back your point of view as well too, understanding that. Um, like, you know, it's when I'm talking to a female leader in our business, uh, I'm not a woman. I don't, I don't, I haven't had the same experiences, but I want to, I want to understand what the challenges are and making sure you're working with somebody who, who want, who's interested. You know, I, I've, the more I've gotten in diversity, equity, and inclusion, the, the more I realize, I say that I don't know, but how different as a white male, my experiences have been versus are ethnically diverse and, and our, our female colleagues and um and i need to i'm learning more and more and so making sure that you as a, as a diverse candidate find those relationships where you can share that way you can get the best out of the coaching relationship because it's going to be a different set of experiences um and, and find people who are passionate about it and and, and really want to make a difference because again you know people hear what you say but they see what you do you can talk about this all you want if you're not working for a company and for a leader who's actually making those commitments, recognizing it's going to take time, um, but you will you'll you'll see the people out there that are really committed to doing it, and make sure that you're you're working to build those relationships with them. Outstanding, Keith. Uh, I think you said uh, first of all, be aware of your strength and leverage them, but don't, but also be aware of your weakness and don't ever let the weakness sink you. You have to improve them so they don't sink you. And, and then be, be also uh, on the lookout for advocates and mentors who get it and be honest uh, in your conversation with them so they can help you. That's um, the biggest thing, David, I think is, is having a great advocate, sponsor, mentorship relationship where it's really open, honest, and transparent. And it's in a supportive way because, um, and, but I do think it's hard. I think it's difficult sometimes when you're coaching someone who is a diverse talent you, you know, I, I found myself going, hmm, am I being as open and honest as I need to be? And, and saying, and, and sometimes I found I probably wasn't. I probably, because I was saying, well, I don't want them to think that I'm not supportive of them and they're a diverse candidate. I don't want them to take us the wrong way. The reality was I was doing them a disservice if I wasn't being really honest with them. And so I, that's the biggest thing I've changed in my style, which is still supportive and coaching, but being really honest and that versus the, then like hiding something that later on in life is going to hold them back. Yeah. Keith, uh, I can tell why you are such a successful and effective CEO for IHC Hotels. You, you really get it and you practice. Um, 
what, what uh, you walk the talk, really. And I, I appreciate that. It's been a wonderful conversation, Keith, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. I, I know you have a hectic travel schedule and very grateful that you're taking the time to do this. Well, thanks, Dave. It's been a pleasure to spend time with you. And thanks for everything you're doing at DEI Advisors to really impact people really positively. Oh, thank you for that. And for our audience, if you enjoyed this conversation, I hope you join us on BIAdvisors.org. And um, there are many other interviews on, on the website, and I hope you can join us. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Keith. Thanks, David.